putting up this event and and thank you to Oliver and Biliopoulos for, for the last two very nice talks. And so we are, should be fairly familiar now with um, the fully connected neural networks and, and some concepts of the mean field image. So in this talk, I will introduce um, a different formulation. So it's a general framework for the mean field image and it applies to deep neural networks. And this is based on joint works with Fan Min Nguyen, who is also here. And um, so um, we have, and in, so in this talk, I will try to focus a little bit more on the main concepts that we introduced in order to study and analyze its limits and, um, yeah, and also shed light on some of the main proof ideas. So uh, let me first just very quickly go over the setting. So we are all on the same page. So we'll be in the supervised learning setting. We have data drawn from some distribution P. And if you prefer to just think about the training task and you can think of P as the empirical distribution of the training set. And we are interested in a certain class of parametric models. So, so for, for this talk, we'll be interested in the class of models that are given by deep, neural, deep fully connected neural networks. But a lot of what we discuss will be easily generalized to other settings as well. And our main goal is to solve this optimization problem that minimizes over the, over the, the data distribution a certain loss function that's applied to the true label y and the output y hat of the model. And in fact, we're not interested per se in, in solving this problem, but we're interested in understanding the behavior of one particular algorithm that's often used in practice to, to solve this problem, and that's stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent. So uh, as introduced earlier in, in Oliver's talk, we, we saw the model of a fully connected deep neural network. This is an L-layer network, and we consider here a slightly more general setting. We can weight both the weights and the biases. But uh, as in, as in um, the previous talks, we allow a slightly more general um, type of network than what we usually see uh, introduced in, in practice or standard textbooks. So here, all of the weights we consider can, can in, in Oliver's talk, uh, he considered uh, connecting weights as vectors. In fact, here we can consider all of the weights and biases to be arbitrary elements of Hubert spaces. And also the input here, we can consider it to range in, um, in, in, in a Hubert space. And also all of the results are dimension independent. And, and so the, the main point of the computation of the network model here is just this equation. So essentially, um, HI denotes what we usually think of as the preactivation of the network. So that's what, uh, what the neuron in that layer computing. And the rule for computing the preactivation at the neuron in layer I is simply by averaging over all the neurons in the previous layers, so layer I minus one, of a certain function. So here, phi can be an arbitrary, perhaps nonlinear function, as long as, as it takes as inputs uh, these three inputs. So first, it takes into account the preactivation at the neuron computed by the neuron in the previous layer, and then the connecting weights between the two layers, and finally, the bias at the neuron in layer I. So uh, if you prefer to think about a more explicit model, then the standard choice for phi that we often see uh, is these choices of the functions. So they take uh, some particular form, but um, essentially you can, in, in this case, you can simplify the equation and you can write the vector of preactivations in layer I as simply the vector of bias plus a certain scaling of a matrix multiplication. So we take the weight matrix in layer I multiply by a nonlinearity applied entry-wise to the vector of preactivations in layer i minus one. And the scaling of one over n i minus one is what gives the averaging that we saw in the, the, the formula on the, the previous slide. And uh, it's important because together with a scaling of the gradient in the descent algorithm, they, they constitute what we call the, the mean field scaling regime. And, and so they constitute to certain behaviors that, that we are interested in in today's talk. And these are the type of behavior that we have also briefly observed, uh, also observed in the last two talks. So um, as I say, we are interested in gradient descent. So that's a certain dynamics on the parameters of the network. And it's uh, simply this simple local dynamics where at each time step, we just, take, we just walk in the opposite direction of the gradient of the loss with respect to the corresponding parameter. However, we consider, as I said, uh, special scalings here, and, and these scalings are important, but they're not anything mysterious. We simply choose the scaling so that the, in an order, order one of time, the weight moves on an order of one. So, if you, uh, so here the step size is scaled by a small epsilon, so that means that in a time of, say, one over epsilon, you expect each individual weight to move on an order of one. 
So this is to be contrasted with the NTK regime where we expect that in another one of time with a rise scaling of everything, uh, roughly each individual entry of the weight doesn't move and therefore the dynamics is well approximated by linear dynamics. But in this general mean field case, um, the dynamics is uh, generally fully nonlinear since initialization. And, um, and I want to briefly remark that our derivation of the mean field limit is, is, gen is more general. So it doesn't just apply to descent dynamics. There's, there's nothing uh, so special about descent dynamics. And uh, to, el to elucidate this point, uh, let me just write down in the next slide the formulas for these gradients in the case of the standard model of the network. So that corresponds to the standard choice for phi. Um, so in this case, these scaled gradients uh, take some, some particular shape, but in particular, um, the delta i of h here is simply the partial derivative of the loss function uh, with respect to the preactivation in the i. So the gradient of the weight connecting these two neurons is the function of the gradient of this preactivation and the preactivation at the previous, uh, at the neuron in the previous layer. And the rule for computing these partial gradients with respect to um, the preactivation is um, it will be look, it will look like this, and this averaging is again important, but it is simply some computation by by backpropagation, and and so it looks like a forward pass a computation, but going in the opposite direction. And um, here the function inside the averaging takes some particular shape, but the essential point is that it takes an in input this gradient uh, with respect to the preactivation in layer i, the connecting weight, and the preactivation at the neuron in the previous layer. So in fact, as a generalization, there's nothing so special about this function. And uh, we can analyze as a special example of a generalization, we can replace that function by an arbitrary nonlinear function psi applied to the same three inputs. So, okay, so, um, so okay, yeah. So this is uh, just a brief plot to, to illustrate the, the goal we are aiming at. So this is um, training loss when we train a three layer neural network with growing hidden width, uh, with very large hidden width. And we can see that they, their behavior seem to be very consistent, or almost the same. And maybe that suggests that in the limit, when we take the width of the network to be very large, there's perhaps some, some limit object that, that governs this type of behavior. And okay, so from the last two talks with IID initialization, we already saw that uh, this is the case. And so that we already saw two different formulations of the mean field limit. Um, in the case of IID initializations. And um, so uh, let me first give a brief primer for our framework and formulation, and it's, it, especially in the context that, that we have heard uh, two different nice formulations of the limit. And um, so in, in the first talk, uh, by, uh, and in the second talk, the mean field limit derivation is obtained in a setting of IID initialization. And, and there are some differences there. So uh, in the first talk, there's a condition on um, the input and output ways. And in the second talk, the hidden width has to go to infinity in some particular order. But there's one crucial point there is that the IID initialization really plays an important role. And the limit formulation, they're hinge on a certain degeneracy or simplification in the dynamics. So we saw a very nice uh, explanation or, or ansatz to explain this simplification in, in the first talk by Oliveira that, um, and so essentially the phenomenon is that the weight in the middle layers will evolve in, it will be just propagated as some deterministic function of its initial value up to a small error. And therefore, the, the, essentially, the dynamics doesn't introduce any extra intricate dependency among the weights. And I also want to remark that in the um, other work of Nguyen, there's a different uh, formulation of the mean field limit as set up. And in this case, the limit applies to general initialization. So it doesn't take advantage of the simplification that happens in the IID case. And this will be the route that, we are, uh, that, that is closer to the spirit of uh, the work I'm, I'm presenting next. So uh, our formulation of the limit will apply to general initialization distributions. And in particular, it applies to cases where there's no degeneracy or simplification in the dynamics. And all of the neurons in the middle layers could, could be doing different things in general. And, um, and we will indeed make a use of uh, this fact, it make a use of the fact that uh, we can address settings with no degeneracy in one important application later. So it's not just for the sake of generalization, um, but uh, perhaps more importantly, the, the formulation is based on a novel infinite width representation. And uh, this representation targets directly the, the mean field behavior. And, and in, in particular, it factors out the symmetries of the neurons in the hidden layer. 
And therefore, uh, because it's targeting quite directly the core behind the mean field phenomenon, it, it does apply more generally to dynamics on systems with mean field interaction. So as long as the system of dynamics can be written in a certain way with certain averaging involved over, the, over, certain, over certain neurons, then um, this limit framework can be applied. And, and therefore, we, uh, in throughout this talk, we will focus on fully connected networks. And there are certain related models that can be easily be established. But we expect that uh, with this general framework, uh, it could be conceivably applied to a variety of other settings and network models as well. And however, if you, are, you tell me that you are interested in the properties of IID initializations only, and you're interested in their simplifications, then uh, still you can recover these simplification properties of the dynamics uh, easily by a unified argument, argument using this framework. So before stepping into describing the carefully all of these objects, I want to remark that the, the main object here that we are building towards is uh, something that we call a neuronal embedding. So this is essentially a bridge that allows us to connect finite with networks that are sampled from some particular weight distribution at initialization and an infinite uh, width representation, an inf infinite width limit. And, and so this bridge allows us to understand properties of the finite networks with random initialization by um, understanding just this one deterministic infinite width object. So, okay, so all of these I, I will uh, explain carefully uh, soon in the later sessions. So this is um, now the rough plan for the talk. And the first part I will describe the construction of the infinite width limit. So this is a certain class of objects where our mean field limit uh, will belong to this class. And, uh, and then I will do the most important step, which is to construct, uh, to establish the connection between finite width networks that are sampled from some particular, that, that are initialized with some particular weight distribution and some corresponding infinite width object. And I'll define the neuronal embedding. And um, then we will discuss three applications of uh, these objects that we have defined. Uh, first, we will uh, recover as promised the symmetries or the simplifications effects of the dynamics in the case of IID initialization. Um, and then uh, we will discuss some, uh, some, some global convergence guarantees. So first we will discuss a global convergence guarantee in the three layer case with IID initialization. And then we will discuss a generalization of this to the L layer, um, to the fully connected L layer networks for L bigger than or equal to four. So, um, yeah, so let me uh, start with the first part, which is the description of the limit. And, and to do that, I will first revisit the two-layer two shallow network case. So this is a simplified version of a two-layer neural network. It just uh, has this form of an average. And what you can notice is that if you just simply permute all of the neurons in the hidden layers, then the output of the model doesn't change. And in fact, the dynamics, the gradient descent, descent dynamics on this model also commutes with this action by permuting the order of the neurons. Therefore, it's maybe, uh, it makes sense to ask if there is a representation that doesn't take into account the ordering of the neurons, which doesn't seem to matter. And indeed, um, there exists such a representation. So we simply rewrite this model uh, instead of this average as an expectation over a random way that's drawn according to the empirical distribution of the neurons. So essentially, we just replace this average by an empirical expectation. But now we realize that there's nothing special about this empirical distribution. In, in principle, we could, take, uh, every, we could take arbitrary measure to place here in, in place of this empirical measure. And I will figuratively think of the class of models that are obtained by replacing this empirical distribution with a general distribution as a class of infinite width limit of two layer networks. And indeed, uh, you can use these as, um, as what describes the mean field limit in the shallow case. So um, let's briefly discuss what are the main difficulties that arise uh, if we want to extend this argument to the multi-layer case. So of course, there are still a lot of symmetries in the network in the multi-layer case. In particular, all of the neurons in the, hidden, in the hidden layers can be permuted without changing the output of the model. And it, it's uh, represented by, by this formula here. So we have permutation matrices corresponding to the permuting the neurons in the hidden layers. However, the difficulty here is that these permutation matrices, in particular, when you start to have this big weight matrix W2, they start to have intertwined actions with the same weight matrix. And also, as you can see, each permutation matrix interact with different, with multiple weight matrices. And exactly these intertwined 
uh, actions of the permutation on the weight matrices of the model makes it difficult to just find a way to simply factor out by averaging over all permutations and get some corresponding distributional representation. And so uh, there are many different ways to uh, comment on what are the difficulties in generalizing the two-layer case to the multi-layer case, but uh, we learned about uh, this particularly nice way uh, from Andrea Montanari. Um, and um, however, I, I want to show this simple, simple claim. It's essentially rewriting the model that we wrote in the previous slide, it's just in a slightly different form, but it will be very useful for, for us to generalize to the multi-layer case. So um, I just claim that um, in the two-layer case, any finite width two-layer network can be equivalently written in this form where, okay, so we fix a, uh, so we have some probability space, uh, omega p, so omega comes equipped with the sigma algebra, and we have some measurable function w on this probability space, and we essentially, we just draw a point from the probability space and then take this expectation where we apply this function on this point. So of course, this is nothing different if we just rewrite this expectation as the expectation over the random variable u, uh, w and um, with distribution induced by this probability space. So this is no different from the formula we showed before, but we'll soon see why this becomes useful in the multi-layer case. So uh, let's recall that this is how, the, how our computation works for a finite width L-layer neural network. So, um, and, and also remember that in the shallow case, in the two-layer, uh, we, what we did was to first replace this average with an empirical expectation. And then heuristically, we replace that empirical expectation with a general expectation of a general distribution. So if what, we, what we'll do here, heuristically, the same thing. But let's say we have product probability spaces, omega p, then they're not given to us yet, but let's assume that we have some probability space. And then we define on those spaces measurable functions, w and b, corresponding to the weights and biases. And, and so they go from the corresponding domains to, to the image set. And then we define this model where to compute hi in this model, we just take the expectation over ci minus one uh, of the same quantity that appear in the definition of the finite width network. So essentially we just heuristically replace an averaging over the neurons in the i minus one layer with an expectation over the cor corresponding random variable and probability space. And uh, then that gives us some output. So if you, if you give me any probability space and functions, that gives me a model uh, as a function of the data. And uh, my claim, similar to the shallow case, is that for any finite width depth L network, there exists some product probability space and measurable functions so that the output of the neural network is exactly identical to the output of the model that I just described that are given by these spaces and functions. So um, our work, we call this probability space a neuronal ensemble. So what you can figuratively think of is uh, it forms an infinitude or perhaps continuum limit. It is a set of continuum set of neurons um, from which you can define these weights and biases and para as parameters. But um, in particular, the important thing here that this claim shows is that this, we have just defined a class of models that is a large class. In particular, it encapsulates all of the finite width depth, depth L networks, but possibly many more. And, and we, I can figuratively refer to this class of objects as the arbitrary or infinite width uh, limit networks, uh, uh, infinite width networks. And um, for this talk, we will focus mostly on the optimization aspect of the objects in this class, in particular, how these optimization aspects relate to the finite width networks. But uh, I think it would be interesting to study this class of objects, so the class of object with this representation and these models from a variety of perspectives. For example, we can study them from the viewpoint of approximation theory or generalization theory. But uh, these will be orthogonal directions to what I will show you next. And um, so, yeah, so we are interested in the behavior of gradient descent on the networks. So next I will define an analog of gradient descent that evolves on this uh, limit object. So, it will be defined according to some equations, but I, I want to tell you that there, there's nothing so important about the equations here. What I did is just simply to go into the finite layer, finite width case, and then all, all of the times I see averaging 
over averaging over neurons in a certain layer, I heuristically replace that with an expectation over the corresponding random variable and probability space. And as I remarked before, the gradients um, in, in the computation of the gradients in the finite width case will take, a will take some particular mean field form. So you can always replace all of the averages in those equations with the corresponding expectation. And uh, this is what the equations of the evolution will look like in the standard model, but the equations are not important. Uh, just note that our infinite width model will evolve in, instead in continuous time and with gradient descent, but we will connect it later to the discrete time stochastic gradient descent on the finite width networks. But um, yeah, so all we did is to replace averaging heuristically with expectation. So now we have defined a class of networks, a wide class of infinite width networks, together with an evolution on that network that uh, a, a, that is derived as an analog of gradient descent, but is a priorly not connected uh, in any sense to stochastic gradient descent on finite width networks. So next is uh, uh, the most important step of the framework, which is to have a connection, to build a connection between finite width networks that are initialized according to some particular distribution and, and some corresponding infinite width limit. And, and, would, and we'll soon define this concept of a neuronal embedding. But um, before that, uh, let me show you a way to sample finite width networks given an infinite width network. So this is a simple sampling procedure. Uh, let's say you are given some product probability spaces and on those spaces you have defined some measurable functions, W0 and B0. So, um, and let's say that you want to sample, you want to initialize a finite width network where the hidden widths of the network are given and, and these are Ni. So what I can do now is for each of the neuron in layer i, so there are n of those, I sample independently a random point from the corresponding probability space omega i pi. Then I can initialize my finite width network, I just sam uh, my finite width network, by filling in the weights according to what the functions w0 and b0 evaluates at the randomly sampled points. So uh, this is a picture of what happens. Um, it's a simple procedure. We have L minus one probability spaces for the hidden layers of the network. And in each of those, we will sample our desired number of neurons. So there will just be independent sample points in these spaces. Then we connect all of the points in adjacent layers because as an architecture we are interested in. And we fill in the weight uh, of the network according to what the function uh, at the infinite width net, what the function in the infinite width network tells us. So in particular, this, this allows us to initialize, this gives us an initialization distribution for finite width networks for any, for any, for any width that are given. Um, however, the, the thing to note here is that this is not how we initialize a neural network in practice, right? Because in practice, we are given beforehand some weight distribution on the finite width network. And we want to initialize the network with that corresponding weight distribution. For example, you tell me that all of my weights are IID distributed according to some distribution. So now the, the thing we need to do is to build a corresponding infinite width network so that it connects to the desired weight distribution row on, on the network initialization scheme that we want to study. So, uh, and, and that is exactly what the neuronal embedding does. So let's say that we have, we want to, we have some L layer neural network with finite width and initialization distribution row. And perhaps we have a family of networks with this initialization distribution row in an appropriate sense. A neuronal embedding is a tuple of product probability spaces and measurable functions on the corresponding spaces such that if you sample the finite network according to the sampling procedure that I just showed before, uh, using this tuple, so using the infinite width network that's given by, by this tuple of spaces and functions, then the constructed um, finite width networks that are sampled from this infinite width one will have exactly the same initialization distribution as the distribution row. In particular, that tells us that if we want to understand properties of networks initialized with row, then perhaps we can alternatively understand the properties of networks that are sampled from this uh, infinite width object. And, and so that is a key connection here. So in particular, the uh, neural embedding allows us to embed 
all of the finite size networks with initialization distribution role into a single infinite width limit. And our hope now, and okay, so note that the connection here between the finite networks and the limit is only through the initialization distribution. So they match uh, in terms of distribution at initialization. But the, our main goal is to understand the property of the gradient descent path. So next we will try to establish the connection on the level of the gradient descent path on the level of the dynamics. So first I need to define a dynamics at the limit level. So we have a neuronal embedding and recall that when I defined an infinite width network, we defined a dynamics on that network, which is some mean field, uh, mean field type ODE that evolves in continuous time. And so we can run that dynamics with initialization given by the functions that are given to us by the neuronal embedding. And uh, so when we do that, we have an evolution of these functions where the neuronal ensemble, so the product probability space stays fixed in time. These functions evolve. And we refer to those functions as the, the evolution of those functions as the mean field limit. So it's a dynamics, uh, essentially a gradient descent dynamics on the infinite width network that corresponds at initialization to our distribution rule. So, um, okay, so our goal now is to establish some connection between this limit dynamics and the stochastic gradient descent dynamics on finite width networks. So um, to establish that connection, recall that we have our sampling procedure and we have, uh, recall that we have sampled a neural network with finite width from the infinite width network according to these relations. So these relations give us a way to couple all of the finite width networks with distribution row with, um, with the mean field limit. And now we can compare them, um, compare the stochastic grand descent dynamics on the finite width network with the mean field uh, dynamics on the limit network. And note that this stochastic grand descent doesn't look at the limit at all. Even though, even though this network may be sampled from the limit, we then evolve it on its own based on the equations of stochastic grand descent. And, and these equations are not related in any way to the limit dynamics. But uh, we want to show that along the whole trajectory of gradient descent up to some time, these two uh, trajectories, the grand descent trajectory on the finite thing and the limit trajectory will be very close to each other. And so we introduce these norms, which is essentially uh, encode um, the maximum deviation between the, bet between the dynamics, between the stochastic grand descent dynamics on the sample network and the dynamics on the level of the mean field limits. And our main result shows that indeed, um, there is a, we can tie those two dynamics together. So uh, under some mild assumptions, with high probability, we have that up to some time big T that we are interested in, the, the, traje the trajectory of stochastic grand descent on the sample network and the trajectory predicted by the mean field limit will stay uniformly close to each other. And here we have a, a completely quantitative uh, error rate. So as this error will go to zero, as long as the step size epsilon is taken to zero, and as long as essentially all of the hidden width and I go to infinity at any rate. So essentially, as long as the rate is reasonable in the sense that you don't, uh, in the sense that we don't have one hidden width going to infinity exponentially larger than other hidden widths, then this error rate will go to zero. Um, also note that uh, here we have the uh, certain constraint that one layer cannot grow too fast compared to other layers because we provide strong guarantee on this infinity norm uh, deviation between the trajectory. So if we weaken the notion of closeness that we want, then uh, we can uh, also weaken several other parts. But um, yeah, so the regularity properties we assume are, are mostly some of, for technical reasons, for example, we assume certain smoothness properties and uh, the weight should be, say, bounded at initialization. Uh, but uh, in fact, if it could be easily generalized to um, more general settings, for example, allowing the weights to be sub-Gaussian or have appropriate tail. Um, so in particular, this theorem now tells us that we, we have a way to couple all of the finite, uh, to couple the gradient descent path on all of the finite networks with initialization distribution role with this single dynamics on the neuronal embedding on the limit object. And so in particular, if there are properties about the dynamics of the finite networks that we want to understand, then we could alternatively understand these properties through the limit only. And so in the next three sections, I will illustrate some applications of, of this framework. So 
sorry. So sorry, there's a question in the chat box. Huh. Uh, so uh, instead of some kind of measures, it's some functions W and B that are moving. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so here the things that are moving are the functions W and B, but once you have the characterization of the evolution on W and B, in fact, uh, you can uh, sit down and for ex it, you cannot write a measure evolution in the general case because this uh, framework is general, but let's say in the IID case where you know, and we will prove that there are certain simplification effects, then we can easily take the equation for those functions and derive the corresponding distributional equation at the level of some appropriate measure. But, um, okay, but we, don't, uh, we won't uh, step into that. Bit. So, yeah, so, so next we discuss applications and, and these we will establish, yeah, thanks. And these we will establish only at the level of the mean field limit because we saw that if we establish these properties at the limit, then we also learn some corresponding thing about the finite width networks. So the first thing I, I do is to recover as promised the symmetries and simplifications property uh, when the mean field limit is run according to IID initialization. So, um, yeah, and so we already know from the first talk that there are very nice simplifications properties there. And, and we actually saw an, a, a very nice answer that perhaps explain what is happening there. And, um, but first to apply this framework, let me guarantee you that there always exists a neuronal embedding for neural networks whose weights are initialized according to some IID distribution. And here we consider a slightly more general setting where we also have the bias. And uh, so next we will uh, show our results that characterize the symmetries in the mean field limit. So this is a simplified version of our result. It shows that uh, if the weights and biases are IID, then for all of the middle layers, the middle layer weight is a Borel function of only its initial value at time zero and the initial values of the biases at the two adjacent neurons. And uh, furthermore, the same thing applies for the bias. The bias in the middle layers will be only a deterministic, for a function, particularly deterministic function of its initial value at time zero. And in fact, we have a complete characterization. So we understand uh, everything that happens even at the edge layer. So for the input and the output weights, but the dependency there is uh, slightly more complicated um, um, and is stated in this theorem, which, I, which you don't need to read. But essentially it says that for all of the weights and biases on the network, we can exactly characterize which quantity at initialization dictates their behavior at time t. And for the edge layer, it will be slightly more complicated. But uh, okay, so let me remark that the Borel deterministic functions here are, are not just mysterious quantities. They can be obtained by solving an explicit self-contained system of ODEs. And in view of uh, the framework that is put up uh, by Oliveira uh, or in the second talk, uh, this, uh, these equations correspond to the equations that uh, characterize their limits. Um, so we, we can recover that formulation. And uh, let's say that we are in the simpler case. This is what we saw in the first talk where we don't have biases. So if the biases are initialized to be all constants, they will stay constants. And the weight of the middle layers at time t will depend only on its value at initialization. So in particular, this is the phenomenon that we saw in the first talk where at any time t, the middle layer weights will remain IID random variables. So um, essentially the dynamics doesn't introduce extra dependency into the weights and uh, into the weights of the middle layers. Furthermore, uh, we can use this to show that for the such IID initializations with no biases, all of the preactivations in the middle layers will be the same. So all of the neurons in the middle layer will compute exactly the same function. And this simplification might seem a bit too much, so it may be undesirable in certain applications. And indeed, uh, we'll see a case uh, that argues for that. Um, but uh, let me quickly remark, um, this is not true uh, it, even when you introduce biases. So the, it, when you start to introduce biases, the neurons can be already distinguished from each other. So not all of the neurons in the middle layers will compute exactly the same function. There will be index, the, the, the bias will distinguish the neurons from each other. But also this type of degeneracy doesn't hold yet in the case of three layers. So in three layers with IID weights and no biases, uh, the preactivations at both of the hidden layers are still not all the same. So they're still doing something uh, different there. Uh, and this is uh, another interesting observation. 
it says that in the standard model of the neural network, so it corresponds to the standard choice of uh, the function phi. And if we have no bias and IID weights, then for all of the middle layers, there, will, there exists a function only of time and the layer, such that the weight at time t of, or between all neurons in layer i will be simply be a translation from its initial value by, by this deterministic function of time. So essentially what this is saying is that if we don't have bias and in the standard architecture, then all of the middle layers of the network just degenerates into a single translation parameter. This is a quite strong degeneracy effect that, that we have when we are under IID initialization. Okay, so uh, let me step now to the, uh, the other two applications, which are uh, perhaps more interesting. So uh, the, we'll, we'll, step, we'll establish global convergence guarantees, a certain global convergence guarantee and uh, under certain assumptions. And first we'll do that in the three layer case. And here we assume the standard model with IID initialization, where as I remarked, there's, there's no strong degeneracy yet. Uh, and essentially that's the reason why we can do this in the three layer case, but we'll see later that uh, it's much harder in the deep case. Um, so this is a, a simplified version of the theorem. So we assume some regularity properties of the activations and these three key assumptions. The uh, first assumption is that if the partial derivative of the loss with respect to the y hat output is zero, then the loss is zero. In particular, this property is true for, for some standard convex losses. For example, if you take the square loss, uh, we have a general version of the theorem that applies to all convex losses as well, but it gets at a different conclusion. Um, it's these uh, two are important assumptions. The first one is a diversity uh, topological assumption. We assume that at initialization, the weights W1 in the first layer has full support in its domain, which is RD. And um, the second assumption, which is important, but perhaps very standard because they, they essentially are the reason that we, came, that we became interested in neural networks in the first place, perhaps, is the universal approximation assumption uh, which just here assumes that the nonlinearity sigma one in the model satisfies that if we look at sigma one of w dot x as a function of x and is indexed by w ranging in rd and this is a dense class of functions in the l2 space of the input distribution and this is we know we there are standard results that show that this holds for very generic choices of nonlinearity sigma one and here we make a simplifying assumption that we're in a noiseless setting. So why is some function of x? But uh, it, the results applies in the general case as well. And finally, there's, a, there's certain convergence assumptions on the weight, but we will discuss this in more detail in the next slide. And the conclusion we get is that um, as time tends to infinity under the mean field dynamics, so under the grand descent dynamics on the mean field limit corresponding to this initialization, we obtain that the expected uh, the expected loss will converge to zero. In particular, this tells us that if we take the hidden width of the network to go to infinity, and uh, we let time to go to infinity, then we can guarantee that under stochastic gradient descent, the network will uh, obtain a, an expected loss that is arbitrarily small. So uh, let me go into details on these conversion assumptions. So first, we assume that the gradient of the second layer weight goes to zero uniformly. And in fact, we assume that it goes to zero locally uniformly in the output weight W3, but that's not important. And uh, we assume certain marrow convergence um, mode in moments and roughly these correspond to some sort of Wasserstein uh, convergence. But know that we, we, don't, we don't have a major theoretic formulation here. So it's phrased somewhat differently. But um, let me uh, remark that this is perhaps not an unnatural or forced assumption, because if we expect in, in under uh, general, under generic situations, if, we ex if you expect that the expected loss is converging to zero, then in fact, this is a necessary assumption that uh, for, for, for convergence of the loss. And um, okay, so here we obviously saw that we don't need the loss L to be convex. So we are moving away from the convexity regime. And what we are using, in fact, as a main ingredient here is a universal approximation property, which is uh, much more uh, special uh, to the class of neural networks. And um, also, we are not making assumptions on the limiting distribution of the mean field dynamics. So we don't make assumption on the distribution of the weights at convergence or at infinite time. Um, because it could be, if it, the proof would be much easier if we make assumptions on the limiting distribution. For example, if we say that the distribution of W1 in the limit either has full support or has a density, 
So in these cases, uh, we can recover the results in an easier way. However, we think that it, is a, it could be perhaps a natural assumption for certain important settings and application. But it's interesting here that with this uh, milder condition, we can already uh, cover, uh, we can already obtain convergence properties. So uh, let me briefly talk about the proof ideas. So uh, first, of course, we look at the second layer weights and we factor it in some particular, particular form. This is a gradient of the second layer weights, which is converging to zero. And the key step uh, of the argument is to use the symmetries of the mean field dynamics that we, we have a characterization from earlier. Uh, instead, rather we characterize in the deep case, but in the three layer case, we have similar characterization. And uh, we use topological invariance, so in particular, some, some tool from algebraic topology, to, in order to show that the diversity assumption, the, full, the fact that W1 has full support, does not just hold at initialization, but it will necessarily hold at all finite time t. Uh, but not, again, not necessarily at conversion. And we combine these two things together with the universal approximation assumption. Um, we can, uh, by some manipulations, obtain that the gradient of the loss is zero for almost every data point, and therefore the loss will be zero for almost every data point. And that's the desired conclusion that we wanted to achieve. Okay, so I will not remark so much further on this because we'll, we'll see the second proof and we'll conclude something interesting about the, this mechanism from both proofs, but let's we note that there are two main steps here. First is a uniform convergence, and the second is some sort of topological invariance properties along the network dynamics. And uh, okay, so now let's discuss the general L-layer case. Um, so first, what's the difficulty? In the three-layer case, uh, if, you, if we inspect carefully, and we can see that the proof really relies on the diversity of the neurons in the first layer. In the deep network case, it is because the, 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 the dynamics degenerate so much in all of the middle layers, it is very hard to propagate this diversity through the depth of the network forward or to propagate some gradient information on the way from the back of the network uh, to the first few layers. And because of this initialization, it, that, that, that makes it hard to obtain by a similar mechanism, some sort of convergence guarantee. And um, so the big question is whether we can obtain cobalt convergence for deep networks, fully connected without changing the architecture. So I want to uh, briefly remark that if you allow me to change the architecture, then I can find ways to propagate some sort of diversity through the depth of the network. So this is conceivable, for example, if you have a skip connection all the way from the first layer to the L minus one layer that produces some piece that perhaps preserves more information about the diversity. Um, and so this is true, for example, when you consider residual networks where we have skip connections uh, between every adjacent layers. However, we were interested in seeing if there is any kind of global convergence guarantee using the similar mechanism we saw before uh, that applies to a network with just a fully connected architecture with no modification. And uh, we, can, we can show that that is indeed the case. However, we have to make some trade-off here and we have to assume a different initialization distribution. So we saw that the IID distribution were kind of problematic in their degeneracy. And uh, so we have to introduce this bidirectional diversity condition. And you don't have to read it now, I will explain it in the next slide. But essentially all of the other assumptions are essentially the same as in the three layer case. And we obtain a similar conclusion that the expected loss under the, the training dynamics on the mean field limit will converge to zero. So what's this bidirectional diversity condition? Um, and uh, it, it, okay, so if you look at each neuron in layer I, and look at all of the connecting weights between this neuron and the previous layer that is encoding some function, let's say it's a function in L2 of PI minus one, so the probability space encoding the previous layer. And if you look at all of the connecting weights between this neuron and the subsequent layer that's encoding some function in L2 of PI plus one. So what I'm requiring is that if my neuron is ranging in layer I according to the probability distribution PI, then these two functions will sweep out a set of, uh, of dense support. Um, okay, we will sweep out a set of dense support in the corresponding function spaces. So it's a somewhat technical condition and I can write down examples of uh, initialization distributions that satisfy this property, but they all look technical. So I won't describe or go into them in this talk. Um, and okay. But what it's saying here is that as long as you have this bidirectional diversity condition on the initialization distribution, then under the same architecture, we can obtain um, global convergence guarantee. 
Again, we have, let the, let's discuss the convergence assumption. Um, here, instead of the middle layers, uh, we assume that the gradient of the last layer weight uh, converges to zero uh, uniformly and a certain appropriate convergence in moments that are, again, some sort of analog of Wasserstein convergence. And uh, we also, uh, and so let's also remark that if this is a necessary assumption. So if you expect that the expected loss is going to zero, then uh, you will have this uniform convergence. So um, two remarks. The first one is we, 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 we could obtain this convergence guarantee with not, no modification to the architecture. And the uh, second one is that the bidirectional diversity condition on the initialization really necessitates a correlated weight initialization. So you cannot use IID initializations to get that. And uh, we saw a reason for this because there's just so strong degeneracy in the dynamics when we are under IID initialization. So I will, I will run very quickly through the proof ideas. Um, so um, we'll, again, we consider the gradient, the gradient of the last layer weight using our convergence assumption. We write it in some particular form. And um, the key step here is again of topological nature. So we'll use a flow argument to show that the bidirectional diversity condition, in fact, it does not just hold at initialization, but it holds at all finite positive time t. And um, using these two ingredients and um, the certain, uh, okay, and our universal approximation assumptions, we can show that the preactivations uh, of the network at computed at layer i will have full support in the L2 of the input space for all of the hidden layers. And so combining all of those, uh, we can obtain the desired conclusion, uh, quite similar to the three layer case. So what's interesting here is that you have observed that the two proofs are very similar, in particular with the main ingredients for the proof are essentially the same. And um, so it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a new general scheme that can be applied to study global convergence. It's, a new, it's, an, it's another mechanism. And uh, in this mechanism, these are key, the key ingredients. So first we have uniform or perhaps some appropriate mode of convergence of gradient updates. And we have diversity that ideally we want to assume only at initialization. And, and we hope to show that we can have such or guarantee such properties at any finite time and perhaps across the depth of the network. And so usually you can hope to, to show this by topological invariance properties of the network dynamics. And um, the third important thing, but standard, is uh, some sort of universal approximation property. And um, Finally, just combining all of these ingredients, then we can obtain global convergence. So essentially, it's combining an appropriate convergence mode and topologic, topological diversity in order, to reduce, uh, in order to inject into this mechanism and reduce global convergence to universal approximation properties, which we know may be standard for our network models. And uh, so I want to remark that, um, uh, that this diversity condition is inspired and it was first used and, and we are inspired by the condition in the very nice work of Chi and back in 2018, where global convergence is shown for two layer networks under a different mechanism. And, and in fact, this is a very interesting and nice mathematical argument here. And also we have other settings where we have global convergence, they say in the, in the shallow case, for example, if you use noisy FGD, then uh, in the work of uh, May, Montanari and Nguyen in 2018, there's also a convergence uh, guarantee that is shown there, but based on Langevin dynamics. And um, okay, so let me just uh, quickly uh, summarize some of the key objects that I have introduced and uh, some, of the, some of the key ideas. So first we constructed the, first we talk about the construction of the neuronal embedding. Uh, and if we have a neuronal embedding for the desired initialization distribution, then we can obtain a mean field limit that tracks the gradient descent, descent dynamics of large width networks and the mean field scaling. So instead of uh, trying to understand these finite networks, we can just go and study this mean field limit. And um, the mean field limit applies uh, here, our framework applies to general initialization distribution. So we can generally just avoid uh, degeneracy situation, but it can recover those type of simplifications in the IID case uh, with, a, with a nice argument. And um, we use the mean field limit to, to build a mechanism for global convergence guarantee of stochastic gradient descent. And first we apply it in the three layer case, but we, we also show that we can obtain it in the deep fully connected L layer case if, you make, if we make appropriate assumptions on the IID distribution, uh, on the initialization distribution. 
So I want to remark that there's quite a lot of flexibility here. So we, we as we saw in this talk, uh, we have taken a more centered, weight-centered approach for constructing the neuronal embedding. But in general, if you have perhaps some other quantities of interest, then you can have a lot of flexibility in constructing these probability spaces, omega and p, and then put functions of u and b on those spaces. So for example, you can take omega to be the space of functions over the data set, either infinite or finite, and omega can, so it, omega p will encode some distribution over the functions with the data set, and they can all be the same. You can, we can also try with more playful ideas. For example, we can take omega i to be the class of functions over the omega i minus one, or perhaps omega i plus one, or we can take it to be the class of um, functions over the preactivations in the previous layer. So there's a, there's a lot of choices here, uh, and, and that, leads to, that leaves a lot of flexibility for exploration. Also, for this mechanism, uh, that reduces global convergence to some sort of approximation property. They are the, the three key ingredients are um, some appropriate convergence mode. Uh, we, tweet, we, we made a choice here, but perhaps there are a lot of other modes that work. Some sort of diversity condition, so some topological properties of the network dynamics that we can show to persist through time, or perhaps we cannot, we can assume at convergence. And, uh, and so, these two ingredients together with universal approximation can be used to show global convergence. And there's a lot of room for mix and match here in this whole framework. And uh, so uh, in particular, uh, by, con by constructing, by, by mixing and matching these ideas and by constructing some particular embedding that targets at the quantity of interest, for example, the function of the data, and by making appropriate assumptions for, for this, to inject into this mechanism, so an appropriate diversity condition and an appro and appropriate convergence assumptions, uh, I'm aware that, uh, that there, there, has started, there has started to be explored, um, these ideas have started to be explored in some more recent works, and there are interesting conclusions that can be made about uh, different types of models and architectures. And so I think this, is a, this could possibly be a fruitful and interesting starting point for, for, further, for, further, stories and for, for further studies, and it could possibly conceivably be applied to a wide variety of network models to obtain interesting conclusions. So um, I would just want to conclude quickly with uh, a few future directions. So first, I think it's interesting. An interesting question is to establish quantitative rate of convergence. We don't have anything like that here. And it's hard even in the two-layer case, but there's a very nice paper by uh, Javan Mart, Montanari, and Mondelli where, where um, using tools from using like, nice and sophisticated tools, it, it can be established under some conditions. Also, I hit all of my dependency on time, but uh, it will be interesting. So the coupling between the finite width network and the mean field limit in our work will deteriorate as time grows. So it will be interesting to obtain uniform in time coupling between the finite networks and the mean field limit, perhaps under appropriate conditions, but uh, we're not, it's not so clear what these types of conditions are and what their arg argument will work. And finally, now that we have factored out the effect of width, um, is there something quantitative or perhaps explicit that we can say or study about the effect of depth? Um, as you saw, depth makes the problem quite a bit harder, uh, probably harder to train and like the gradient descent dynamics more complicated. So uh, all of the results I discussed are available in these two uh, papers on, that are available on archive. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, let's thank the speaker. And thank you for your next talk. It's really interesting. interesting. We have uh, some time for some talks, uh, for some questions. So uh, the audience can just unmute and ask questions. So um, can I ask a question, Hui? Yeah. So um, I know that in the two layer case, um, if the limit, is, if, you assume, if you assume that the limit of the time derivative is zero, then um, that works by the Chisa and Bach argument, but in the two-layer case, they, can, they only need to assume that the limit is unique, not necessarily that it is zero, and um, they use a more SART condition to compensate for this, for the weaker assumption. Have you looked into something similar here? Yeah, I, I previously looked into it, but it's certainly not the thing I presented. But thank you for bringing it up. This is a, I think this is an interesting, no wait, this is definitely an interesting point. So the arguments and the mechanisms are different and they, they do have a weaker, um, 
we they have, have weaker conditions for in exchange for this more side property that's hard to verify but it as, as you say it uh, it does provide guarantees uh, assuming weaker conditions not not uniform convergence to zero so we take this viewpoint of convergence to zero because it's natural from the viewpoint of the laws but of course it uh, i think it should be explored what happens uh what, whether we can have other types of condition that are more plausible to that more, more amenable to verification than that and uh yeah so i think perhaps some direction that mix these two types of arguments uh yeah in order to find some 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 different type of condition that is sufficient would, would be interesting for exploration but yeah i, I prefer looked into it but not to the extent that i would yeah thank you can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so if I understand correctly, it is assumed that this function is WI has a limit and your global convergence characterizes what the limit is, right? So yeah. are there uh, regimes that one can say something that guarantees this limit? Uh, so yeah, again, I think this is a great point. I, I, I think it is hard in general, and I think other experts here may, may speak to this, but uh, to to verify in which situation we could have a limit. I think it's a difficult question, even in the shallow case, right? There's still some sort of convergence assumption that may need to be made in order to make it work. And uh, perhaps except for the, this quantitative convergence in the shallow case, I, I don't know if there are many other examples. So here, yeah, I cannot, uh, this argument, and I cannot say much about whether there exists a, a limit or not. Whether dynamics will converge to a limit. Is that uh, yeah, so in particular, whether things can like blow up right so uh, yeah yeah so yeah, so it's definitely 